Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Under the Influence. I'm your host, Riley Shoemaker, and we are here with Ray Hersey. She is a New York-based influencer, fashion girly, amazing person, and we've worked together for mm, still under a year, under but for a year. Yeah, almost a year, almost a year now. Um, we worked together on her show, Vintage in the City, and it's been amazing getting to kind of see her creative mind at work. Um, so I just want to say welcome, right? Thank you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you got started on social media? Maybe start with like an overview of what your content looks like and how it got to where mm -hmm. it is today. Mm -hmm. So um, my content is really focused on fashion, a little bit of vintage, a little bit of like secondhand shopping, um, a lot of finding designer things for cheap. So um, I feel like I used to work at TJ Maxx and I was always looking for like cheap things and um, yeah I feel like that was one of the things that really sparked my interest in fashion but um, in high school I started this company a company I didn't have any customers but it was called Styleberry Fashion Consulting and I created this fashion quiz for people to figure out like what their personal style was and then um, ideally I was gonna like help people shop for clothing but nobody signed up but I had a bunch of friends who took the quiz on like Facebook back then um, yeah, so that's kind of what got me interested. And then when I was in college, um, I studied abroad in Paris and I was bored, to be honest. I had a good time, but I was looking for like an activity and I started a blog. I was just writing for my parents, really. Um, and it Like was keeping like, them updated yeah, on your yeah, travels. Yeah, like here's what's up. I was grocery shopping and like talking about like a, this huge bag of pasta is only two euros and it's ginormous and it's crazy and wine is so cheap and um, Starbucks is so expensive here and stuff like that. And then um, once I got home, back to college, it wasn't exciting to write about those things anymore, so it kind of turned into um, posting about my outfits or styling my dorm room and stuff like that. And then through that, started my social media pages just to find something else to post. And since I was on campus, Aerie and Abercrombie were recruiting people in sororities and um, like in Target schools at and the time. And you went to NYU, right? Yes, okay. yeah. So I was at NYU, um, and since we were in the city, they were looking for people who could kind of do like a hybrid role of like influencer social media posting and live, I don't even know what to call it, like what the marketing terms are, but like on the right. ground, like um, activations. Right. Yeah. So for Airy, one of the things we had to do was we had buckets of sunflowers and we had to hand them out to strangers oh, and be cute. like, a sunflower from Airy. And everyone in New York is like... Um, what's the catch? Like, do I have <laughs> right, to pay? Are right. you going to ask for money after you hand it? We're like, no, it's just for fun. Um, so that was exciting to kind of just get out of my comfort zone in New York, but then to also have the opportunity to do influencing before we even really had any followers. Right. Cause and like connecting with brands. Yeah. You know what's reminding me of is, do you know what the, um, like the Red Bull girls are? That yep, would like yep, drive yep, yep. a little Red Bull can. <laughs> yeah. Like it's giving Red Bull girl. It was exactly <laughs> like that. Um, so we tried to do little things like that. But then once those programs ended and I left college, I realized I kind of had to do it like freelance on my own, which was really scary for me. But um, it was interesting starting out being tied to brands only and only working signed to one brand as opposed to now kind of getting to partner with different brands, creating your own brand and your own content, and then allowing certain brands to like participate in that. And fitting them into your content exactly. versus the other way around. Yeah, like my whole page was like molded to what I right, wanted to be right. at the time. So you, out of college, worked a corporate job. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about what that job was and did it apply to your social media career at all? Mm. So I was working in, I was at a media agency. I was doing, at first I was doing digital ad targeting. And at first I didn't think it had anything to do with influencing. I had my pages on the side. I was doing my own thing. Um, and then it's really come into play actually a lot more than oh, I thought cool. it would. So in my role I was doing um, like buying third party data, like who's been in FIDI recently or who's shopping at Kroger's and that type of thing. Um, and buying that data and then using it to target our clients' ads. But surprisingly where that translated into what I do now is that a lot of times brands want to boost your posts or whitelist it and put money behind the ad you're creating for them to get more people to see it. But I've had some, a few negative experiences. For example, I was working with this brand and they wanted to boost my post and I said yes and I didn't really think about it too much. And then they sent it out. Their client base is literally 
everyone in the United States may be skewing a little bit older and my demographic of my page and my followers is more like women under um, 24 to be honest. Oh, wow. um, That's so, a young demographic. Yeah, so I try to really keep that and maintain that because brands want to work with people who have a very solid like set group of people as opposed to just Everyone. All sorts of people, yeah. Um, especially for women's fashion, I think it's really important to keep your stats, like primarily women, if you're selling women's clothing, um, and then brands just tend to like younger audiences. But um, when they were boosting out my post, it got shown to, I think the algorithms start to like, just see who's engaging with it and then boost it out to more of those people because you can set it to like automated targeting. So they had it going out to everyone basically and it was really going to a lot of men there was a lot of like creepy sexual comments and like weird followers lots of weird followers coming to my page and I'm so anti post boosting but if I do let brands do that I know exactly the target groups that I right. have like I put it in my contracts now like if you're gonna boost it you can only send it to these people because I guess I learned that in my job like yeah. I know what is possible for targeting ads on Instagram on Facebook everywhere so like when the brands are like, mm, we don't really know if we can do that. Like, I know you can do that. So yeah, 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 <laughs> like, exactly. Don't try to like, over. yeah, I've done that. Yeah. That's so interesting, though. Like, the idea that the, I almost said the brand. That's so interesting, though. The idea that the brand had a really wide demographic. So they just cater to their demographic rather than yours. Mm -hmm. And it ends up diluting your numbers and your exactly. analytics, which isn't good for your brand. And they pose it as a, like a benefit for you. Like we're going to help boost your post, but I don't want my poop, my post, my, <laughs> I don't want my post boosted to people that I don't want to see my content. It doesn't right. make any sense. Right. And I think that plays into the whole idea, which is, and I think that that's a, con a constant push and pull with brands and creators is the idea that you're creating an ad for them but it's in everyone's benefit for it to suit your content and seem natural to your page and not seem like an ad people like you know really covert ways of advertising when they don't realize it's an ad and sometimes you see it and you're like oh shit that's an ad like, yeah that's so cool that's the best thing you're ever like proud of them i love yeah. seeing that on tiktok where people are like yeah girl like get that bag like people are so proud of creators for exactly. like doing certain collabs that are such a good fit yep absolutely absolutely so in your corporate experience you learned how to have a job kind of go through things as a professional um, and I think something that's interesting, and this isn't like pertaining to anyone in particular, but I feel as though in influencing, like a lot of creators don't know how to advocate for themselves in a job, or they just don't know how to like go about having correspondence with brands when these are like, you know, really professional work environments that are maybe a little more stale. Mm -hmm. It's not like you're in the DMs like, hey, let's let's partner. Mm -hmm. um, so what is like the biggest lesson that you've learned um, from your job that you've been able to apply aside from the paid marketing thing? Yeah, I think, hmm. I guess I would say professionalism overall, um, but also structure and organization where mm -hmm. like at my corporate job, you have your weekly check-ins where the Excel document with the updates on everything is due, just being very organized and knowing what the status of everything is is so yeah. important to me and just helps me stay calm and like collected because yeah. there's always like different things in negotiation, different things um, happening and it's hard to keep track of like where everything is. So I think for me that's been really helpful. Um, but like you mentioned with email correspondence, I think a lot of people are very casual about it and it's hard to remember that I think every like PR influencer team is different, but a lot of those people are just sitting in a regular office and that's their, just their, their job. job. It's not like they're walking around, like you said, in their DMs, like ready to chit chat. Like they're looking for quick responses, especially with some of the bigger agencies who are recruiting influencers for campaigns. They are like very professional. The way they organize all of the campaign steps is very, very structured so yeah um I think sometimes as a creator you're like oh it's fun they want to see like my creative side but like I don't think those people really care about that at all yeah um and they, they have would, their own KPIs yeah, and they have to hit them and they prefer if you just like get your shit done you're, they're not like your page is already selling them on your personality and like your ability to create content and they just want like execution but that's just some of the people some other brands are very like Flowy, that we're right. like, which hang also, out chit chat. Yeah, so it's strange. Would, That's yeah, hard for me. Would, would you prefer that? I'd say 
maybe it depends it depends on the brand like I think yeah um yeah sometimes it's fun to have those relationships but then it's hard to know exactly where the line is between like fun we're getting dinner we're getting drinks versus like business conversations that need to be a more formal like sit down Mm -hmm. nail out some details right and I think that when it comes to influencing, like you have to be really protective over the work that you offer. Like you have to charge for things. And I, the first thing that came to mind is like restaurants, you know, they expect a lot <laughs> yeah. for no pay. You know, it's like one free meal and they want you to like do a grid post and a story. And that's like thousands of dollars. Yeah, like of way work. more valuable than the meal is alone. But I feel like restaurants yes. like notoriously like yeah. Just get away with it because you kind of want that experience. And I was just talking with one of my friends about this where um, if you're not getting paid, I feel like the expectation should be that you, if you, you as long as you do the deliverables, it should be fine. It's yes. in your control. No notes. There can be no notes. <laughs> so she's been getting notes back and forth from this PR agency and like they wanted her to take it down. They wanted her to like edit all these things. And she was like, if you're not paying me, you can't even ask for that. So yeah. it's like there's not a common understanding between, I feel, or since the industry is so new, there's not really a common understanding between everyone of like what is okay to ask for and what's not. Yeah. And I feel like brands and agencies try to like cross the line all the time. A little bit. Yeah. They try to push, push the limits. Which I get. Yeah. 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 It's like, you know, you want free promotion. Who doesn't (laughs) want free promotion? Like there's people out there who are willing to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Not everyone will like defend themselves or it's exciting to go get free free drinks like for the first time. So yeah. I mean, there, like, there comes a point where it's like, yeah, I'll take the free dinner. Yeah. So <laughs> it's You're like, hard. I'm hungry. I wouldn't pay to go there. Yeah. But if if I have to choose between a free meal and nothing, I'll yeah. do the free meal yeah, and a yeah. couple stories. I guess if you were going to do the content anyways, like a lot well, of Well, that's, that's the other thing. It's like, I personally like, like to post where I'm out yeah. to dinner and mm-hmm. show people that. So it's like, if you're doing it anyways, like, I guess what's the harm? If it fits in. Yeah. yeah but if it doesn't fit with your content and you would like never post a picture mm-hmm. of a meal or, and this goes yeah, for anything, true. like any experience that you do or whatnot, if it doesn't fit with your content, then you have to find a way to like make it worth it for yeah. you. But if it's something that like is kind of mutually beneficial, then mm. so be it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, I want to talk about the evolution of your social media and your style. So you talked a little bit about in college, you were an Abercrombie and Airy girl. Um, and then coming out of that, where did you really see your pages start to pick up momentum? And like, what was the sort of formula that was initially working for you that were, you were like, wow, this is, this is moving. I think like a lot of people, it was really during COVID when we were all like locked down at home. Um, just already having, I think I started the pandemic with like two, uh, 20,000 followers. So I how think wait, were, but you got to, how did you get to 20,000 followers? Cause I like, was just posting my work outfits. I don't. I went to. Uh, I don't even know what I was doing. To be honest, I went to Miami a couple times. You were just times, like cool, and, and people just followed you. Yeah. Like some fashion <laughs> outfits. Um, I wasn't even on TikTok back then. And then um, during the pandemic, I guess I was already comfortable posting a lot, and I kind of knew types of content I could do at home. So once we were all in lockdown, I was just ready to like pump out yeah. all this stuff. So I think that was really beneficial to be in a place or like where. Back then when everyone was kind of like slogging around in their pajamas, like to be able to work from home in between meetings, like hop into a cute little outfit and like take pictures yeah. and be able to still produce content in that kind of setting, I think was really um, one of the big things for me. But I wouldn't say that that was, or I was very like pajama core, like not quite, not quite in my like personal style yet. Right. And really working my corporate job, um, I think really hindered my style a lot where I had to wear five days of the week. I had to wear like a super, not super conservative. Is yeah. Media, but, but like, but like professional, professional, yeah. Like business casual type yeah, stuff. Yeah. yeah. Where it's which like, isn't really your style. Yeah. And you wake up in the morning and you just are like, okay, I'm going to wear this. Yeah. To the office. It's funny. Cause like it. I would, I would say like my personal style is kind of like something you could wear to work. Like yeah. that's like, like I love the like corporate chic, like trouser look mm. you like, are so much edgier and have so much more to offer in terms of styles. So like that makes so much sense. Um, and I remember you had a post at one point where you showed like 
uh, before I found my personal style versus after. Oh. And you were like in just like a very, like a cute outfit. Yeah. But it wasn't like the Ray looks yeah, that yeah. like I feel like your followers knew and love. Yeah. My thing was I always had like a black t-shirt for, I would always wear like jeans and a black t-shirt and like ballet flats or something. But with my black t-shirts, I tried to like find some, like something up. little cool on them. So there's one I have and I still have it in my closet, but I just don't wear it anymore. It's got all these little like ringlets and like mesh on top or something but it's oh, still cool. like a t-shirt and it's cut up to here so it looks professional right right um, but, but I a little like, edgier try, yeah try to have like little bits of personality like that but it was so hard in an office right so during the pandemic just sitting at home all the time I wore pjs most of the time but then after um it's not after but once things started to go back to normal wearing more interesting things and not having to go into the office kind of helped me explore a little bit right. more what I and you actually built, enjoy yeah. wearing. Yeah. And you built trust on your viewers. Yeah. It was such like a renaissance of social media during the pandemic. Oh like God. everyone was on their phones. Like so many people found their stride as creators. Um, I mean, that's like what inspired me to start the show was like just the general like crazy consumption of influencers. Mm. I feel like there wasn't a word for influencer until like... 2018 mm. at least like mm -hmm. or maybe like it wasn't as widely known yeah like I feel like people use the word like blogger to yeah. describe but right I feel like sometimes blogger is the only word you like can use yeah like, sometimes influencer is like a negative connotation but then creator is so vague it doesn't really mean anything yeah but blogger like and maybe like people who started on tiktok don't think of it that way but for me blogger is like someone like legit who's like doing something very consistent and like yeah posts all the time or like has a business but nobody mm. is really like blogging or starting out by blogging do people still read blogs <laughs> I, I never read blogs so that's why I never read me. blogs I only followed them on social media yeah but then like I would like be like showing my mom something she'd be like who's that and I'd be like oh this blogger yeah like that's the easiest way to refer to it yeah it doesn't mean anything yeah I, I feel like especially now it doesn't mean anything as much like I really would love to see what a vlog is looking I almost called it a vlog yeah. too because everything I mean videos yeah, came like it's like true. everything is a vlog now podcast is the new vlog. yeah oh, so, so true so <laughs> basic <laughs> we tried to avoid making under the influence a podcast yeah. and try to make it like a web series okay and then I like I realized like I listened to podcasts I listen to so many podcasts so many podcasts yeah. and I don't watch web series like I'm mm. not a huge YouTube girly I Me love either. YouTube like very like in passing and, I mean, there are people, though, who, like, won't watch a YouTube video unless it's, like, over 30 minutes. Oh, shit. Like, I guess, like, the, the patterns of YouTubers is, okay. like, they like long, drawn out, yeah. not drawn out, but just longer just form lengthy, content. Like movie, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's literally, like... Some of the travel vlogs that, like, fashion girls do will be, like, 40, 50 minutes. I'm like, how... Yeah. How does anyone sit there and watch the whole thing? I, uh, yeah, I saw I, the whole thing on their Instagram stories, literally slide by slide. Right, 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 right. And like, uh, that's how I prefer it. Cause you can click through yeah, it too. Like, yeah. I don't like that. Like on YouTube, you can't like click through a little so bit watch more. Watch it like triple speed. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, I like to listen to audiobooks at like triple okay, speed. Yeah, yeah, Cause yeah. it's like, you can just get through Keep the book going. faster, but then I zone out and I'm like, oh shit, I have yeah. to like, go through that chapter again. Yeah. Um, so which platform on um, social media would you say is like, you're like you're an expert at I would say Instagram but so much has changed um right. the last few months the last few weeks the last few days the last few years that it's so hard to stay on top of everything but I think Instagram really is my like bread and butter mm -hmm. um they have been testing a lot of new features which makes it so confusing to feel like an expert in anything right um I feel yeah. like you always have, like, the insights, though. Like, you're trying the new I things. Try, yeah. I think that's one of the things. Like, experimenting. Yeah. When I started out, I didn't... I was just posting on my own, which I think is how everyone starts out. And then you kind of get to this place where... Um, you have your little community and you know other people doing the same thing as you. Mm -hmm. And then that grows and all those people just like chit chat. So one day I saw everyone was using keywords on Instagram instead of hashtags. And I was like, why did everyone take the hashtags off of their hashtags? You just have all these words there. And then someone told me that apparently that was like one of the mystery things, boosting people's posts in the algorithm. And I was like, okay, wait, so it's so describe random. this. It's a key. Where do you like, how do we do this? Like when you put in your caption and okay. then you put hashtags, then you just write keywords that are on your explore page. Like Fashion, outfit, inspo, Soho, style, edgy, trendy, street style, New York, tank top, blue, purple, tie dye. You don't put hashtag in front of no it. No hashtags. It just... It's just like a string of words. So sometimes people put commas, but I just put 
a bunch of words because the algorithm apparently, and I've seen it work, is looking, this is like right now, like I don't, yeah. it's changed all the time, but it's looking for relevant posts that have these words in it. Interesting. So people okay. say you go on the explore page, you look at the keywords that are on top and then write them all in your thing. It's stressful. Noted. <laughs> okay. Um, and then you're, you know, you've dabbled in TikTok. We worked together on your show, Vintage mm -hmm. in the City. Now you're doing a show called I Love Your Fit, yes. which is on the street content. Um, but it's very you, like the style. I feel like you get to show your personal style, which is, I think is really cool. Mm -hmm. But then you get to talk about someone else's and like bounce off each other. Yeah. Um, so can you talk a little bit more about the show? Yeah. So um, I really love doing it just because I'm able, like you said, to not just like be with the microphone and like talk the whole time. It's like um, hearing from other people and having other people talk about their interests and their style because everyone is so different and everyone um, just approaches fashion in very different ways. I think mm. it's really cool to hear from people directly. So still very new on week one, I think, but so far I've interviewed friends mostly and then a couple strangers. And um, I think interviewing the strangers has been the most rewarding because it's the most surprising. And yeah. um, I think the things they say are just so like shocking and like surprise right. and delight well because your of. friends think like you yeah, yeah whereas yeah. like or I know strangers. what their answers are going to be before I yeah. ask them so. yeah exactly that's so fun to like I love like I always loved the content we got with strangers mm -hmm. I feel like especially like younger people mm -hmm. they have strong opinions yeah. on trends um because they're like oh well that's chuggy or you yeah, know, yeah yeah <laughs> so over that so it's always like fun getting their mm -hmm. insight what is the craziest thing you've ever done for an Instagram post I don't even know. I'm trying to think. There has to be a good example. Well, I feel like you're always like scouting different like locations yeah. that would like look good in pictures and stuff. Hmm. I remember a story you told me once about you were on a ski trip and you guys took the gondola around. Oh like, yeah, 20 I guess times. that was pretty embarrassing. <laughs> we were <laughs> at a ski resort and the there's like a little gondola from the parking lot up to the the base of the ski hill and it kept going like kept going up and down and up and down and like everyone who's working there is just like saw that we looped around like six or seven times because right. there were three of us so we all had to switch and the lighting was different going up the gondola versus coming down and the whole thing maybe it was 30 seconds so it's like right, we each have right. to go twice to get two chances up and two chances down which is oh still not gosh. that much time yeah per person per photo so. right and then we wanted videos too for tiktok so it was so that's was funny <laughs> yeah you got to commit to the gondola yeah. for that any like other, like, I don't know. <laughs> I guess you, I feel you're like not, there has to be something. There has to be something crazy. You're not, like, doing, like, dangerous, like, travel blogger no. type photos, though. Hmm. I'm trying to think of anything from this trip. From your Europe trip? Yeah. Because I didn't do anything crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel like you had a really Maybe, chill outing. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe the craziest thing is, like, setting up your tripod in New York City. I've done that a couple times. On, like, a times, random corner. And it's not, like, that wild of a photo. It's just going to look like a regular photo. But I get so scared putting my phone out alone on a yeah, tripod. Yeah, yeah. I just have to do it early morning. I've only done it a couple times because I just get so nervous anytime anyone walks by and, like... Right, I just right. Run up to it, like, I've never, I guess, I, yeah, I've never thought about that. Like, when the fashion Nothing. girlies are getting yeah. their, like, New York street photos. And over COVID, I think everyone was out in the suburbs with their tripods and it was fine. Or yeah. Like, you got used to that type of content. And then once everyone came back to the city and you had to do it again, it's like, this yeah. is not going to work. Right. Um, so, you were born and raised in New York mm -hmm. City. And you've been living in city or in the city, but you've recently moved to Jersey. Yes. She's, we made her a Jersey, Jersey girl. girl. <laughs> um, what is it like not living in the city as like an influencer who needs to get like interesting content all the time? I think it's a little tough just because, especially in New York, sometimes you can't wear the outfits you're going to be shooting either mm. because of getting like harassed on the street or getting harassed in the subway or you don't want the subway wind to blow up your little skirt or stuff like that. So it is stressful sometimes having to commute now because I was in the West Village before and I was just used to walking everywhere. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's a bit of a burden to get into the train. But um, for events too, you kind of have to events, go an extra yeah. slog across the water. But it's maybe like 20 minutes to get to where I'm going at all times. So it's really not too bad. But in terms of content in Jersey people will judge you if you take <laughs> photos and it's really weird because it's a little like Jersey City is like a little urban area and it's not 
there's a lot of people. It's a lot of people who moved from the city, but there's also a lot of people driving through who aren't Right. Who never go to the city or maybe never see people taking photos. So like without a doubt, one of my friends lives over there too. And whenever we shoot together, not even with a tripod, just taking regular pictures, even in normal outfits, um, someone will like scream out of their car window and you're like, like relax. Like New Yorkish area. Yeah. I don't know why this is so crazy. So that's one of the weird things about Jersey. There's not as many like cute spots to take photos, but I think it's easy enough to get into the city or if I'm here, I'll try to like lump stuff together where right. I do all my photos and shopping and filming and everything on the same day. Right. Um, but and then, events probably isn't because oh, yeah. you're coming back at night. <laughs> That's true. But then it's good because my friend is over there so we can like Uber together, Split take the, the train Uber. together. Yeah, it's good to have a buddy. <laughs> I like influenced her to move to Jersey, which is maybe oh, like my proudest accomplishment. Cool. Maggie McCormick. Oh, love. Yeah, she yeah. came out vintage. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Love. Yes. Um, what were you going to say about the... Um, one of the good things about Jersey though is the apartment space. I, yeah. that was one of the main reasons we moved was just to be in a newer building. And for me, I was on the ground floor of my apartment in the West village and it was so dark. So yeah. working from home there during COVID was just really like containing and there's bugs, there's mice, there's rats outside. And I just didn't feel cute there. I didn't feel cute in my clothes. The lighting was terrible and it was just really hard to do content. So yeah. my new apartment has windows and a big white wall. And it's just so nice to be able to create content in my home, which is something I've been not waiting to do, but like trying to do for a very long time. Yeah. And it was really difficult for a while to have to rent out studios and pack a huge suitcase and you've got three, four hours to like pump out as much content as you can. Right. Um, so it's nice to just have that space in my home and be able yeah. to like not be lugging around suitcases all the time. And just like pick up your phone while you're having coffee and like yeah. record a video if you need. But then it's also hard if you're just sitting there and you're like, I'm so comfy, I don't want to film. Right, right. Like you don't have to like force yourself to yeah. get out to do yeah. it. And then it's like you feel less productive. Yeah, I, so there's pros and cons. Yes, exactly. It's a double-edged sword. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about your transition videos mm -hmm. because, and we talked about this, Ray and I did a panel together like two months ago. Oh, yeah. And we talked about this, but the transition videos that you do for outfits and then the transition fails or the behind the scenes mm -hmm. of the transition, a lot of the time, like I feel like those sometimes do better than the those transitions. always do better and it makes me so angry because I spend, especially for brand partnerships, they don't want like a, I guess that's backing up. Sometimes those do a lot better and it makes me so angry because I, you just put a lot of effort into like the final video or like nailing a transition perfectly. You can't move at all and you need to be in the same spot when your outfit changes. And it's so exciting when it works out in editing. Yeah. But once um, I started posting the behind the scenes as like a sneak preview of the transition to come, those would just do better because I think it's so relatable. Yeah. Like one of them, I was like throwing my shoe and I was like, how do people do this? Like the transition where you kick your shoe and then you're in the new outfit. But I was like, in order to do that, you have to kick your shoe and like, and like hurt injure your, your foot. foot. Yeah. yeah. So people, I feel like really related to that. And then people ask for the results in the comments. Oh my God, results, results, results. And then you post the results and like, it gets views, but not as, not many. as many. Yeah, because yeah. I think it's not funny. And I really struggled with a way to find... I feel like TikTok is very much based around humor, and I am not, like, a comedian by any means. I don't crack jokes, like, randomly. But, right. Um, I was struggling to find a way to make my fashion content somehow humorous or, like, relatable or, like... Right, and have your, like, personality yeah. shine through, yeah. but and in a way that seems genuine. Yeah, and it was always, like, too strange to, like, just plug a joke so this kind of like worked out as like a way where yeah, I don't have to perfect. like say things into like a microphone or just like I don't know yeah, yeah. it just kind of happened I didn't expect it and right. then um, I just started doing that for all my transition videos now because when I'm filming the transitions I have you have that content that ready to go anyways mm -hmm. yeah the last social media app I want to talk about that like is very new in the market, can you guess which one I'm talking about? Be real. Yes. <laughs> I love. Okay. Do we think? I feel like a lot of people are like making predictions for be real. Like there's gonna be be real influencers. It's gonna be the new Instagram. It's candid. What are your thoughts? Because we're friends on be real, so yeah, I love your be real. I love be real. It has a lot of glitches, but I just feel like. It's going to end in a few months. I think yeah. all, there's all these little apps that keep popping up. And so far, there hasn't been anything people have really stuck with. But yeah. I do really like the idea of an app where it is just your little bubble community of friends again. Because um, 
that's what Instagram is kind of taking away. I saw mm-hmm. a TikTok someone posted where they were like, why did I literally just find out that my cousin's pregnant like four days later? Like the algorithm is not putting out Yeah, content. it's not showing you what you want yeah, to see people anymore. People post their weddings, people post all this important stuff on Instagram and it's not about exploring and finding new accounts. It's about having your friends like Facebook was mm-hmm. before and now it's Instagram, but now it's not Instagram. So I think something does have to come out that does provide that value for people. I don't know if it's be real, but it's kind of fun for now. Yeah, I mean, it is fun. Do you think people would ever go back to Facebook? Maybe. Or like a new Facebook? Yeah, I feel maybe. like I feel like Facebook is too triggering. It's so, like formal. <laughs> Facebook almost feels like LinkedIn now. Like, yes, just so very, true. Like so many different things, but I miss making like ga- or what is it albums? I you do miss your yeah. Album. Now it's photo dumps yeah, and it's like curated true. albums. That's true. So yeah, it used to be so many photos just in photo dumps. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like three of the same photo yeah. in a the photo chat dump. Chat on there was nice. There's Facebook Marketplace yes. groups. My cousin's going to college this year, and there's no Facebook group for all the people. That's so crazy because I was like, I was, like such a thing. Each other? Yeah, yeah so interesting. Thing. Well, I guess we'll see. Well, it's, I know. it's an ever-changing industry and landscape, and it's so fun to get your insight. So thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me.